Okay, so welcome Jim, Jim Champion. Jim, you're a secondary school teacher and you teach physics. He first encountered secular Buddhism in April 2016, has been practicing it since then. Jim lives in Southampton in the UK, we're in New Zealand in Wellington. And Jim is a member of the Middle Way Society, an international online community known as Recollective. He's involved in the production of books for the two free projects, including this one, which has just come out, the um, After Buddhism a Workbook by Winston Higgins. Uh, and the project in which you're going to speak to us tonight is Understanding the Buddhist Metaphors Going Beyond Allegory. So Jim, welcome to New Zealand. Over to you. Okay, Ramsey, thank you for the introduction and hello everyone. Um, in talking about the, the Buddha's metaphors, I, I kind of uh, am going to have to make a few assumptions about what you know. So forgive me if, uh, if I have to check with you or uh, anyway, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, the other thing I've realized in, in um, preparing this is that, um, is that uh, I, I probably need to give a little bit more of an explanation of, uh, of what I or how I interpret the middle way. Um, so that, that's what I'll do. I'll start off, uh, tell you a little bit more about myself, a little bit more than what Ramsey's just said. And uh, I'll say a little bit more about um, what I understand by the middle way. And then I'll talk about uh, some of the Buddha's metaphors and how you don't have to interpret them um, just through a sort of a, a, the usual traditional, there's only one way of interpreting this uh, kind of uh, interpretation of the metaphors or the similes, um, but in a way that hopefully is going to be helpful to anyone, um, whether or not they would uh, define themselves as, as Buddhist or, or following the Buddha. Um, so to start off with, uh, Ramsey said that I um, I'm part of the Middle Way Society in the UK. Um, it's something that's been around for nearly five years, and it's it's not exclusively in the UK, but it's uh, it's main, most of the people who associate with it are in the UK. Um, and uh, I've only been a member of it or involved with it for about the past two or three years. Um, when it started, it actually grew out of um, uh, a meeting or a gathering of uh, people who were interested in. Uh, a secular approach to Buddhism, a, a, you know, a bit like what Ramsey's doing in New Zealand, but it, it went off in a particular direction and the emphasis was on the middle way. Um, now, I, I can't uh, claim that all of these all of these ideas that I'm coming up with are, are things that I personally um, have been developing. They're mainly the work of someone called Robert Ellis, or uh, Robert M. Ellis, I think, to distinguish him from other ones. Um, he's the chair of the Middle Way Society. He was, uh, if you like, the, the founder as well. Um, maybe at some point you'll, you'll hear a talk directly from him. But um, anyway, as it is, I'm giving credit to him because basically these are his ideas that I'm uh, expanding on. Um, and he, he, there should be a book out in the not too distant future from him um, about interpreting Buddhism. Um, uh, in or secular or secular approach to Buddhism in, in terms of the middle way, right? Um, so um, anyway, I'll explain what I'm going to do. So I, I better get on and do it. Um, so the first thing is um, when when I'm talking about the middle way, I'm talking about something that you can see in the if you like in the life story of the Buddha or the historical story or the legend or however you want to phrase it uh, I'm going to assume that people are you know familiar with that because I, I mean I remember learning about it at school in a in religious education lessons um, but when I'm uh, talking about this story usually the story is presented so that the the bit where the Buddha um, gets enlightened or he's awakened it's a specific event and if you like that's the that's the pinnacle um, of the story, that's the most important thing, and um, and that's I mean, that's always how I've seen it ex expressed in sort of traditional approaches to Buddhism. Um, looking at it from the perspective I am involves seeing uh, sort of a different part of the story as perhaps the most important thing, um, and it's his realization prior to this you know traditional um, enlightenment moment um, that there was a middle way to be followed, and that was the path he was going to take. So uh, very, very quickly, um, a bridge story is about 2,500 years ago, there was a, um, a prince or anyway, a son of someone who was in the ruling class in uh, some place in northern India. Um, 
various names are given, but we'll go for Siddhartha Gautama. Um, he was living a life of luxury. He was part of the ruling class. Uh, basically, he didn't have to, you know, he, he wanted after nothing. He, he had what he wanted. He had a, basically, he was living the life of Riley. Um, at some point in his, in his uh, sort of, uh, late teens or early 20s, um, he saw beyond this, uh, this like, protected life that he'd been living. Um, and if you like, uh, you know, these things led him to question what was, uh, what was going on. He decided to leave the palace behind, if we'll call it the palace where he was living, um, and he goes on a spiritual quest um, in sort of beyond the palace. We'll call it the forest because that seems to be where sort of the wild, that's where, where his uh, spiritual quest took place. Um, he met up and, and joined with various uh, spiritual teachers, people who were like considered to be um, people that you would go and train with if you were on a, on a spiritual quest. Um, and basically he was, you know, you don't know how much exaggeration there is, but um, he, he was able to sort of do the, you know, the sort of the spiritual attainments that these people in the forest could do. Um, but still it left him unsatisfied as the things that had originally sent him out on his quest is uh, when he saw he saw someone that was sick. He saw someone that had grown, was growing old and aged. Um, he saw, saw someone had recently died. So these things that had bothered him about life that he'd never really had to consider before, he didn't think that anything he'd done with his spiritual teachers or anything that they'd taught him, which he'd been able to match, um, it, was, it still left him unsatisfied. He, there was still, you know, sickness and aging and death. Um, and, and these things, you know, how, how could he... Uh, live in a world that was, that was like that um so um if just to explain what i mean by uh, the way i'm looking at the middle way um think about it as a middle way or the buddha realizing so i keep calling him the buddha perhaps I'd, you know traditionally he's not called that till after this enlightenment which happened later in the story um so going back to what he was uh, looking at a middle way between um think about the palace where he'd grown up um, and the worldview and the assumptions of what life was like in the palace, and then the assumptions that uh, he would have had, and that the people who were uh, living in the fort, you know, on their spiritual quests in the forest would have had. Um, you can su- you can sort of summarize what was what his palace life was like in terms of uh, like hedonism or hedonism. Um, that it was it was self indulgent. If you wanted things, you took them. You were sort of gratifying the body all the time. I mean. It sounds a bit gross in those terms, but that was the sort of luxury life he was living, where he, he didn't have any material wants, and the idea was that he, you know, he he would be happy if he could uh, sort of satisfy him, so you know, his these you know, needs that he had as a as a person, basically chasing happiness. Um, contrast that with the worldview in the forest that's is typically described as rather than hedonism, it's described as asceticism. So you know, you'd given up these uh, sort of luxuries and so on and, and more than that you were denying your body and its needs so sort of the way forward there was you, you know you ditched um, this chasing after material pleasure and, and you know they did some pretty extreme things involving basically fasting which was verging on starving yourself or um th- there's a bit where he's describing trying to so they did some kind of meditation where they tried to stop themselves from breathing so sort of bringing themselves all, almost to the point of uh of sort of destroying the bodies they had as if that was going to be the way you know the way forward for them um so that, that's one of the contrasts between the palace where he'd grown up and then the forest where he was on his spiritual quest and neither of those things individually um had satisfied his you know his what he needed to get from his spiritual quest um there's a little there's another oh, another pair of um opposing worldviews that you can uh, look at as well and it's not not the one that you normally hear, but for example, in the palace, his life was one of conventionality. So, um, how would he look at the you know what was his ethical view in the palace? It would have been that you know he was born into the ruling class. That was what he would do. Basically, if you, you can sum it up as the idea of you can, you can imagine him being told you know be a good prince, do the things a prince do. Don't worry about what you know those people out there are doing. That you know that's their place. They have to do what that is. So it's uh, in, in modern terms, you might talk about it as a kind of relativism that you know he had his world worldview and his roles to fulfil, you know, and what was right for him was right for him, and then you know other people, you know, 
typically people who weren't in the ruling class, people who are out working the fields or, uh, you know, soldiers or whatever, people who are outside his experience, you know, they had their business to attend to, they had their role in the society, um, you know, and what was right for them was right for them. So a kind of relativism. This can be contrasted with um, the assumptions out in the forest where the spiritual teachers were. Um, basically, that, that was a kind of like religious um, absolutism is probably the best word, where you know, there were these spiritual teachers and you would go and submit yourself to one of them and your spiritual teacher would have, uh, you know, will, will be enlightened and uh, he will know, or it was generally he, um, he will know the way, you know, the one true way. That was very different to the relativism of the palace. So that's another pair of things um, of uh, contrasting worldviews between the palace where he'd grown up and the forest where um, he was on his spiritual quest. So having set that up um, as two contrasting worldviews um, and the Buddha sort of at a sticking point um, where he'd, you know, he'd lived one kind of life, he'd lived almost you know, the complete opposite kind of life, leaving his family and the, the palace and so on behind on his spiritual quest in the forest. Um, this is the, the point that I'm, uh, I'm recognising as being the key thing we can get from this, this traditional story about the Buddha is that he recognized that there was a middle way between fixed viewpoints of his palace life and the fixed viewpoints of his forest, uh, the forest life that he was living. So this middle way, or how we did it, um, this is actually described in the, in like the, the traditional story in, in the, the Buddhist texts. Um, what happened was well, he was basically at his wit's end. He was, he was starving. There was pretty much nothing left of his body because he'd been doing all this fasting and um, trying out all these very ascetic practices, trying to make progress with them. Um, apparently what happened was, or this, this is how it's described, is that he recalled a time um, back when he was uh, like a, you know, a child or a young man um, back in the, in the palace. And he, you know, his, whatever his father was doing his business, there was, you know, all the palace business was going on. And he was sitting under what's described as a rose apple tree. Um, I don't know what that is and was uh, quietly meditating, but not in the way that he'd been doing on his spiritual quest in the forest. He had been um, very mindfully meditating. He had not been trying to deny his body or, um, you know, or basically get rid of his, uh, sort of his physical body. Um, he was in touch with it. He was connected with it, and he was mindfully meditating um, as a child. And that's when he realized that there could be a middle way between um, this ascetic uh, sort of path that he'd been taking that was, was almost literally killing him and um, and his previous unsatisfactory life um, sort of his hedonistic his relativistic life in the palace now um, to, to try and like summarize you know to shrink that down a little bit more to make it a little bit more digestible um, what he was doing was he had taken his experience he'd had these very different experiences but what happened is he was looking at them in a much broader context. He wasn't completely focused on what he'd been doing during his spiritual quest. Um, he was able to sort of go back to the time that perhaps he thought he'd left behind um, and to draw something from that and look at his, both his two different kinds of contexts he'd been living in, in a much bigger context. In terms of the, the middle way as, as a, a, a metaphor, um, the way is an idea of a path and a, a middle is sort of a balancing between sort of whatever's on either side. Um, the point was that he, when he'd been on his spiritual quest, he thought that there were certain things he had to learn and things he had to recognize through doing all these practices. Um, what he recognized when he recognized the middle way was that practical ideas about the path, about how to go about moving, you know, moving along, making, making progress, if you like, but going along the path um, were sort of prior to or higher than any goals he had um, based on sort of fixed ideas from the worldviews that he was embedded in. So uh, I've written it here to, <laughs> to make sure I say it clearly, but the idea was that he could put practical ideas about the path he was taking um, above any rigid views about the goals that the, the path might eventually lead to. So um, in what I'm gonna be doing, uh, talking about uh, metaphors and how this, this middle way is likely to be more useful um, than any uh, than other aspects of things you you may know or understand about um, sort of 
traditional interpretations of Buddhism. Um, in the middle way, we're, we're not talking about like a specific sort of set of instructions or prescriptive list or things you have to believe. Um, in this sense, the middle way is a principle of judgment. So it's not um, like the, for example, his forest, uh, the Buddha's forest teachers would have sort of had lots of metaphysical claims or be, you know, appealing like his family may have done to sort of natural law that, you know, they, 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 they'd been put there as the ruling class. So he's not making, um, well, this, this middle way is not making claims um, to, to metaphysics and so on. Um, it's a principle of judgment. Um, the other thing is that, or another thing is that it's not going to guarantee particular results. So again, his, um, he knew that living his, uh, his palace life he would have ended up um, with, uh, you know, in a particular place, you know, he could sort of see where that was going to take him. And um, similarly with the, the, when he was in the forest on his spiritual quest, um, that he, he would have, you know, there would have been specific goals um, that they would have had in mind. I don't know whether they called it enlightenment or whatever. Um, but the idea is that, you know, you may have goals, but maybe by having these fixed, you know, very uh, absolute ideas of what the goal is, then that's not necessarily going to uh, be the best way of progressing in the circumstances you're in. So, um, the middle way allows for adjustment on the way for reassessment of those uh, those goals, basically so you can make more adequate judgments as you move along through your life, not just having one fixed idea in the future of, of what the goal is and, and that's it. Um, in terms of the way, it, the, the way it will work, the main thing is as a middle way, you're avoiding on either side absolute views. So um, it, it, I've already uh, highlighted some. I mean, the traditional one is the, the idea of the middle way as being a middle way between asceticism and denying the self and um, sort of hedonism and uh, indulging yourself and your senses. Um, but that's not the only way it has to be interpreted. So perhaps that, that's my, my key point about the middle way is it, it doesn't just have to be um, a middle way between asceticism and hedonism. It can be between uh, t any two things that are you know rigid dogmas that are, that are held as absolute beliefs um i, I well i assume but based on, based on a, sort of the, the other speakers that i know you've had that you're likely to be familiar with uh, stephen bachelor's way and uh, way of interpreting the, the four noble truths as the fourfold task um so when he's talking about that and talking about um recognizing um, our reactivity and how our reactivity can cease um, that's the problem with these absolute views is that they're there. I mean, we, we can't live in a world that, where they're not there. Um, but they, uh, if, if we stick with them, they basically keep us stuck in those patterns of reacting to the environment. And there may be, if we take a middle way, um, more adequate ways of, of reacting. So um, I think uh, Stephen Batcher refers to it as responding rather than reacting. So the middle way is a way of helping us to recognize um, what that more adequate way would be on the path um, and that includes or that basically involves um, recognizing what these absolute things are and um, and negotiating our way between them rather than getting trapped in, in one particular way um, one particular worldview or another um, now just just to uh sorry just to uh give you an idea of what we're looking out for if i describe i'm going to describe Five things from that story about the Buddha's uh, about the Buddha or Siddhartha and, and um, what he that part of his uh, spiritual quest that was before anything to do with the traditional focus on his enlightenment um, that will help you hopefully understand a bit some examples of what I mean and then I'll look at the metaphors. Okay, um, the first thing is that when when like crunch time came for uh, Siddhartha Gautama, when he was uh, dissatisfied with his spiritual quest, having done everything he thought he could do, um, he found his way beyond it, not by, you know, by uh, completely reverting back to his palace life or um, completely giving himself up and just going, OK, I'm just going to do what these spiritual teachers tell me. Um, so he didn't, you know, just submit himself to one or the other. And similarly, he didn't completely reject both of them so he he made progress by keeping both of them in mind um whilst recognizing that these these two worldviews weren't um it, you know there was some uncertainty in them it wasn't so 
Um, this is highlighting the idea of recognizing uncertainty in the kind of beliefs that we have about you know, the way things ought to be. Secondly, um, when, when he experienced life beyond the palace, um, he saw these things that are traditionally referred to as the, as the sights. Um, these are the things that he saw that he hadn't really encountered before that made him question his worldview, like seeing the sick person, seeing the, uh, the aged person, seeing the, the person who recently died. Um, importantly, there was a fourth thing he saw. Um, he saw um, a holy man, uh, presumably a kind of ascetic, probably had wandered out of the forest, presumably. Um, and the point is that, that he saw things that challenged his existing worldview, and he was open to them. He didn't just sort of shut his eyes or tell his, uh, whatever, his coach driver to take him back to the, his chariot driver to take him back to the palace. Um, he was open to these new things. Um, and also by being open to these new things, he saw the possibility of a, of a way forward that he had never ever considered before. So, I mean, translating that a bit more generally for this second point um, is that basically he had the capacity um, to be critically aware of, of the limitations of whatever worldview he had at the moment. I mean, that, that's not easy. We're, we're immersed in our worldviews. But by being open and uh, to other, whatever, the sights that we might see, for example, in the story, um, and to be aware of alternatives. So that's going to help us um, in making more adequate judgments on, on our way. Um, the third thing was, uh, he, when, when the Buddha, or sorry, when Siddhartha Gautama was um, dissatisfied with what had achieved in the forest, uh, he didn't just flip, he didn't just go straight, you know, initially he'd lived this luxury life, he'd thrown all that in and gone on his spiritual quest. He didn't then revert back by throwing in the spiritual quest and going back to the life of luxury. Um, he found a way to, to move on where um, he didn't you know, absolutely believe in either of these worldviews, but you know, he had them both in mind. So um, he managed to keep these two absolutes um, one side or the other and didn't get too, or didn't get tangled up um, in sort of arguing about one or the other. He just recognized that both of them were experiences he had, he had had that he could draw on, but he didn't need to get sucked into those. Um, the fourth thing is, um, with these uh, these spiritual teachers that he'd, he'd uh, trained with on his spiritual quest, um, a lot of the, you know the, the the talk would have been about them having achieved some kind of special status, some kind of jump to you know a different plane of existence or consciousness or whatever. Um, and what um, Siddhartha had, had recognised was that basically yes, they had achieved a certain level of, uh, sort of spiritual attainment, but it was it was something that. Um, you know, it was a matter of degree rather than uh, so. And he saw that as well. That um, I don't know you probably experienced this with meditation. That how uh, you think, you know, oh, you know, I've, you know, if I do it right, then I'll, I'll magically, you know, I'll be everything will be perfect. Um, and this idea of recognizing and being able to to live with things that are a matter of degree and to recognize that because that that's our experience, um, rather than getting stuck on things being, you know, this must be true, this must be false. You're either this or that. Um, to, to look more at the process and the, the gradual approach rather than, um, you know, things being starkly, you know, black or white type situations. Um, the, the final thing, the fifth thing that is useful to, uh, to, to bear in mind when we think about what, what do we mean by taking the middle way, um, that while he was on his quest, the ideas about, you know, the goals at the end of it had changed. Yeah, so, um, and it's not that he had somehow uh, destroyed you know, the worldview of the palace or destroyed the worldview of the... Uh, the point is that he managed to look at them in a bigger context and to bring them together, and that meant that he himself had, had moved on. So he was able to resolve the conflict he had between these two different worldviews. So um, uh, this is the only thing I'm going to use a technical term for. I'm going to refer to this as integration. Um, and so, you know, it's a process. One becomes more integrated by taking things that are... Um, conflicting, uh, you know, beliefs that are conflicting, and finding a way to resolve them without necessarily, um, you know, absolutely going for for one or the other. Um, I've, uh, probably the most concise description of it is this: if if you're uh, undergoing a process of integration, you're uh, effectively and uh, long term resolving conflicts you've got between different desires and beliefs you had. Um, I mean, if if referring to the, uh, the, the, the traditional story about uh, Siddhartha. Um, he had the, these conflicts about, you know, how can I live it when he 
learned about what life was like beyond the palace. He was wondering, how can I, you know, how can I live in a world like this? Um, he was able to make progress with that particular quest. Um, he was able to resolve the conflict between his life of luxury, his, his um, you know, ascetic life, um, without necessarily, like I say, it found a third, a third way, a way through the middle of those things. Okay, right. So the other, the other part of what I wanted to talk about um, was to do with, uh, and again, might have to come back to this another time. Uh, I spoke to some, uh, the, the group last year as well. Hopefully I'll be invited back for next, next time. Um, but to talk about some of the metaphors and to look at them in this more, this more general way, this way of taking a middle way that avoids absolutes on either side. Um, I'll start with one that you've uh, hopefully heard of before. Um, I mean, in, in the sort of the traditional uh, Buddhist texts where they, you know, record, you know, things the Buddha said, um, it's absolutely saturated with, with metaphors. Um, when I'm talking about metaphors here, I, I, you know, analogies, similes, or parables, if you like, um, I'm not talking them about them in terms of um, an allegory. Um, an allegory is where you've you've got a you know uh, a story that's uh, you know metaphorical and you know it's an analogy, and um, and then it's interpreted in one specific way. Um, perhaps the sort of most the most common ones that we're aware of are things like um, Aesop's fables, where there's a, you know there's a story about some animals usually, but um, it's you know it's interpreted in a particular way. It has a specific message, and and that's what you know that's the correct way, if you like, of interpreting it. Um, looking at the the metaphors, the analogies that the Buddha used, um, but interpreting them in a more general way um, is 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 what I'm talking about here. Is about going beyond. Um, an allegory where there's a, you know a specific if you like correct answer uh, for what the Buddha was talking about and to recognize that he was someone who was in touch with his um, his experience and that he was avoiding um, committing himself to particular metaphysical views he was interested in um, his his actual embodied experience the experience you know, of, a, of a person being in the world and um and not sort of deferring to uh, sort of ideas that were beyond what what one could experience and not ascribing certainty to any of those things so the the first one that um i'm just going to read sort of a, a version of it. i think i've paraphrased a bit is one about the arrows um and then i'll say a little bit about um how, how i interpret that in the middle way so um this is, this is how it goes i'm just reading it uh, when an untrained person has a painful feeling, he's filled with sorrow, he grieves and laments, he weeps, beating his breast, and he becomes distraught. He feels two feelings, a bodily one and a mental one. It is as if a man has been shot with an arrow, and then immediately afterwards he's shot with a second arrow. So the man will be feeling a, uh, the feeling caused by two arrows. When the untrained person feels that painful feeling, he resists and resents it. When he experiences a pleasant feeling, or even a painful feeling, or a neutral feeling, he feels as one who is fettered by it. However, in the case of a well-taught person, when he's touched by a painful feeling, he will not worry or grieve or lament, he will not beat his breast or reap, and he will not be distraught. It's one kind of feeling he experiences, a bodily one, but not a mental feeling. It's as if a man was shot with an arrow, but not hit by a second arrow following the first one. So this person experiences feelings caused by a single arrow only. Um, now, again, you, you may have heard of it before and you, you, you may have heard uh, sort of various interpretations of it. Um, usually when, when I hear these sort of traditional ideas, it, it basically sounds a bit like when you're, you know, I don't know, you're in, let's go for pain because that's the most obvious and sort of universally experienced one. You're in pain and uh, it's sometimes these interpretations sound like someone telling you, well, um, you know, it hurts, but thinking about it only makes it worse, um, which, you know, I've never found that, found that particularly helpful. And uh, quite often this, I don't know, this, this, uh, this analogy seems to be interpreted as well, you know, basically, you know, you're going to experience pain and, and so on, but, you know, you're only making it worse by, by thinking about it. Uh, so, you know, it seems that the, the magic answer is, well, you know, just stop thinking about it and then, you know, suddenly, you know, uh, the problem your problems will be over um uh, in that analogy as well it talks it talks about the trained person and the untrained person i mean presumably in 
in the uh, the context 2,500 years ago, he was talking about someone who had sort of uh, been following his uh, his teachings for for how to pursue a middle way, um, as opposed to someone who hasn't. Um, in in terms of trying to look at this in a slightly different way of you know uh, trying to get away from the idea that well all we need to do is you know uh, become enlightened and you know you won't feel this um, psychological pain anymore. Um, even getting away from this psychological interpretation of it um, is this idea that you know your first arrow, uh, the first arrow, the the pain that you experience, or, or it might like I said, it could this also applies to sort of uh, pleasant feelings as well. Um, it's it's when you uh, it's when you go after that first arrow when you view it um, as something that's absolute, as something that's that's very fixed. You look at it dogmatically that's when the second arrow comes about. That's when your second source of pain comes about. So you know, things will happen, yes, and you will experience discomfort or you'll experience pleasurable things, but knowing that they're going to end. Um, but it's, it's when you, you fix, sort of uh, look at it with a very fixed view, um, that, that that's when you've got the, the, the problem, the extra pain uh, that comes about in the second one. Um, I mean, it's... In terms of uh, looking at it in terms of a middle way, it's, um, it's this idea of resolving the conflict between two things. So, for example, um, and again, I don't know if, uh, how many of you have experienced this, but uh, in the past few days, I've been visited by um, an old friend. Uh, the old friend is lower back pain, so uh, down here. Um, it, it comes sometimes, but the, I mean, the point is, you know, that the physical pain in itself is bad enough. But then there's the, you know, um, if I'm not careful, there's the conflict I'm having with, <laughs> with the, the idea of, you know, ah, oh, this this pain is, you know, it's unbearable. It's never going to go away. It keeps coming back. How am I going to, you know, cope with this? How am I going to? And you know, it, it recurs <laughs> time and time again. Um, and, and similarly, I'm not, I'm not claiming that somehow I've, uh, I've magically been able to ignore this. Uh, and, and secondly, I'm not saying that I've thrown away um, painkillers either. I mean, I'll take pharmaceuticals if it helps. Um, but see, seeing pain in a, in a wider context um, is, 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 like, is the middle way, is the way forward to being able to um, try and uh, resolve the conflict that I'm having. It's not that the pain, the back pain is going to go away, you know, well, it will eventually of its own accord, but um, it's that the struggle I'm having with it, and, and again, this is this is a, a sort of a fairly modernist or secular interpretation. It's a psychological interpretation, and um, you can't get away from the fact that it's been a very useful interpretation as well, um, with uh, like John Kabat-Zinn and all the stuff about uh, mindfulness-based uh, sort of pain relief, the stuff that he's he'd worked on in the US, um, as sort of Cut, sort of branched out of medicine into the the mainstream and become this this whole like mindfulness phenomenon. Um, that in itself, the the idea that by putting your pain in a broader context, it can help incrementally. It's not you know going to magically make the pain disappear, um, but it can help you towards um, being able to cope uh, better with with the problem you're having. In, in that case, with uh, with the pain you're having, um, it's it's also a sort of that kind of um, clinical use of, uh, of, of mindfulness as a, a way of dealing with pain. Um, it can also help you break out of like a, a loop that you get trapped in. So by avoiding absolutes, one of the things you can do is avoid getting trapped in like a, you know, a, a vicious circle, if you like, um, where you, you know, you're looking at the pain and, and the pain itself is preventing, you know, your reaction to the pain is preventing you from seeing the, the wider perspective. And I mean, you've probably had this and I've had this, uh, this too but it, it might be that my you know i'm getting stuck in this loop of arm oh, you know my back hurts and oh, there's nothing i can do about it uh, and then my wife will say to me well you know have have you done this have you taken this and, you know perhaps it's time for you to go to the doctor you can get so stuck in in this uh loop of thinking that the, you know the pain is all there is and i you know there's not i can't do anything about it um allowing yourself to be open to wider experience you know to to other views um this is one of the, you know, the practical uh, grounded applications of what I'm talking about with the middle way. Um, you can, uh, so the thing I'll, I'll just round this bit off with, um, yeah, the idea is it's, you're putting um, some kind of unpleasant experience or the fear of losing a pleasant experience in a bigger context. Um, and if you like, that's, that's how I've um, looked at this, uh, this parable to do with the arrows. 
um, is that it's not like I said, it's not that you can lose the second arrow, but you can maybe weaken its effects. Um, the, f the first arrow is still going to be a problem, um, but it, by resolving your, your conflicts with that problem, um, by integrating them in some way or another, um, you, you're, you're not going to experience such a great problem to such a great degree. Jim, can okay. we, uh, we're yeah, to, Jim, we're going to have to stop you very soon. This is 35. That's fine, yeah. yeah. So, can, we, can we take some questions now? Certainly, yeah. Yeah, and uh, if, if, again, if uh, you do want later the, the other uh, analogies and uh, allegories and so on, it's, you know, it's something I can easily come back to. I hope, I hope that would be a very good idea because we've had 25 okay. It was the introduction before you got on to your main part? You oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> time. Well, that's the thing, yeah. Let's yeah. invite people to um, please, if you have got a question for him, go up and sort of please approach the, the, the laptop and, and put your question. We've got a whole lot of stunned mullets here in the room, I think. <laughs> Must be someone. I don't have a question so much as can just. You, do you want to approach? Go on, give it closer. I'm sorry, no, I can hear. I can hear. <laughs> strange metaphor, the two arrows thing. Like getting shot with one arrow, that's bad. I don't think getting <coughs> shot with the second one, that's twice as bad. So it seems like a better use of effort to just not get shot with arrows in the first place. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree. <laughs> yeah, no, but like, yeah, like I say, it's not a question, but. Um, it's perhaps is I mean one of the ways of looking at it is if if you think about the the specific analogy that was being used there, um, it was um, something that you know basically a weapon that um, people in that context would have been familiar with. Um, it, it would have been something you know something that's feared, something that's that's painful, uh, and some, something that could strike you know um, without warning from a distance. So it's it's not like you, you knew it was going to come. So. In that respect, it's it's a reason you know it's a pretty good way of talking about um, the kind of the way that we do experience painful things um, or the fear of losing um, things that are, that are pleasant to us. Um, you know, in that and so in that sense, that kind of analogy of being you know things coming out of the blue and hitting you and you know yes that you know that, and that's gonna sorry it makes it sound like an awful world to live in doesn't it because <laughs> at any moment you might you might be shot but that that kind of is the world we're, we're living in and um and you know as as people of uh, as meditators you know you can appreciate that 100 percent that um you you can be um you can be you know sitting there and out of the blue or, you know things will come up your mind's capable of doing that um and it, it's the you know it's the how sometimes you think well you know i react to it so fast you know the second arrow you know you have some vague feeling of discomfort and then bam you've made it worse by you know worrying about it that's the second, the second arrow but um you know it's not that you can um see these things coming so perhaps that's one of the more useful aspects is that um you're not going to be able to stop these things happening you know whatever if things will come at you in you know in the, in the analogy arrows might or an arrow might come at you um, you're not necessarily going to be able to avoid being, you can obviously do things to put yourself in circumstances um, where, where you're less likely to get hit by arrows. Um, but I mean, even, even Siddhartha, and, you know, if he was in, in his palace, so perhaps he's less likely to be shot by you know, a random assassin um, there, but it, it's, it's not 100% certain that he's um, going to avoid, avoid uh, you know, being uh, in, injured, but yeah, feeling pain in, in some way or another. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Let's ask if there's another question. I will take one more question, and I'm afraid it's going to have to. That'll be it for the evening. So okay. Any questions? Pete, do you have a question? No. <laughs> uh, Jim, it's very, it's very good of you to, to talk to us, and uh, it's very interesting. And we kind of only really scratched the surface, I'm afraid. So yes, yeah, we'll that's be back again next year, and perhaps yeah. we could be a bit more focused on what you want to say rather than an introduction. That would be very welcome. Uh, and in the meantime, I just want to, as a, as a bit of a plug, this is the plug that the book that Jim has been working on is called um, "After Buddhism: A Workbook," and Jim wrote the questions, which are at the end of each chapter, and they're fantastic and they're very interesting and very witty. So. Th thank you, Jim, and we look oh, forward sorry, thanks, to Thanks, Andy, for inviting me.
We will. Uh, it's thank you. See you. Well, we'll be in touch, and we'll see you soon. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Have a good evening.